welcome back to this video lecture series for Introduction to Philosophy. This video will conclude our discussion of the problem of free will, and as we've done a number of times throughout this series of videos, I want to return to the disjunctive argument against free will. Now, so far we've looked at the structure of the argument, and we've seen the reasons for the second and third premises. We've seen the reasons why determinism is said to leave us with no free will, We've also seen the reasons why indeterminism is said to leave us with no free will. Now, if you accept both of those premises, then there really is nowhere to go for the idea that we can be free, or we can have free will, or make our own choices, or control our own destinies. If either determinism or indeterminism is true, and if both of those undermine our freedom, then it just looks like we're left with having to accept the conclusion that we in fact are not free. However, there's another very popular response here which I want to uh, look at in this video, and that is the response of compatibilism. Now, to understand what compatibilism is, let's return to the second premise of the argument. In some ways, the second premise of the argument might seem initially more obvious than the third one. If determinism is true, we don't have free will. If everything that happens is determined by the laws of nature, and prior events, then it doesn't seem there's any room for free will, it doesn't seem there's any room to say that we actually make our own choices and can, can be responsible for those choices. In fact, however, some do reject this premise, and those people are known as compatibilists. And what compatibilists argue, as the name suggests, is that despite first appearances, despite maybe our initial intuitions, there's nothing at conflict between free will and determinism. Free will and determinism are compatible. And that means you can be both determined and you can be free. Cain explains this point. He says the view that there is really no conflict between determinism and free will, that these are compatible, is known as compatibilism. If there really is no conflict between free will and determinism, as compatibilists say, then the age-old problem of free will is resolved in one fell swoop. And a number of philosophers have taken this sort of view. Uh, Cain cites some examples such as Thomas Hobbes, John Locke, David Hume, who we'll look at some passages of later, and John Stuart Mill. And one of the main virtues of this approach is first, it gives us, if it is successful, if they can make good on their promise, first it gives us free will, which seems to be something we want, but also it makes sense of free will within our scientific understanding of the world. So in order to make sense of free will, we don't have to appeal to something like an immaterial soul or anything like that. We can just say, look, we human beings are objects in the physical scientific world. Our actions, like the actions of anything else, are subject to the physical laws of nature and as well as prior events and prior causes. But for all that, we are still free. So the promise compatibilism makes is appealing a way of reconciling our scientific understanding of human nature and human action with our desire and our felt sense that we are in fact free and in some degree in control of our lives. Okay, and so as Cain says, if compatibilists are right, we can have both freedom and determinism and need not worry that future science will somehow undermine our ordinary conviction that we are free and responsible agents. Now let's look at this in a little more detail. So really, we're just focusing on, again, on the second premise of the argument. And the way to explain this is that depending on what your reaction is to this premise, determines whether you're a compatibilist or an incompatibilist. So some people are incompatibilists. They say P2 is true. Determinism and free will are incompatible. They cannot go together. If determinism is true, then free will is impossible. But those who say that P2 is false, those who say the second premise is false, they are compatibilists. They say that even if we are determined, even if every action we take is determined by what has happened in the past, physical causes, the commands of God, fate, whatever, even if every action we do is determined by what has happened in the past, we can still be free. Okay, so in order to understand the compatibilist approach, which initially seems very counterintuitive, we need to address three separate questions, or there's really three separate points. The first thing the compatibilist wants to do is 
demonstrate why com- why determinism is not so scary. It's not so threatening. Right? As we've seen, initially the idea that everything we do is determined by the past seems uh, disquieting, it seems alienating, it seems threatening or scary to our conceptions of ourselves and our conceptions of human beings. So the first thing that compatibilists wants to do is say, look, there's no reason to be scared of determinism. Determinism gets a bad rap. It doesn't imply or mean everything that we sometimes think it does. Second, once they've sort of tamped down our fear about determinism, compatibilists also want to give a new or more precise, they would say, definition of freedom or free will. And the trick will be, how can the compatibilists give a definition of free will that accounts for what we think about when we think about freedom, but also allows us to be completely determined. And then third, the biggest challenge to the compatibilists, because they are determinists, they believe determinism is true, or at least that determinism and free will, there's no conflict between them, the compatibilists will have to give some explanation of what what does the ability to do otherwise mean? Previously said that the ability to do otherwise implies an open future, where there are multiple possibilities, and you can choose among them and have control over which one comes about. But if determinism is true, it seems like the future is closed, and it seems like it's not in our power to bring about another outcome. So how can the compatibilists give a definition or an understanding of what we mean by the ability to do otherwise? So we have to look at all these three questions, and the first thing we're going to look at is what is the compatibilist justification or explanation of why determinism isn't so scary. Now to get at this point, I want to start by looking at an example of something that actually is a little bit uh, scary. I want to look at an example of these brain stimulation experiments that were done by the scientist Jose Delgado. So Jose Delgado, he did these experiments on the human brain where he stimulated the brains of his patients and it caused them to perform certain actions. You know, they might look around the room or they might raise their hand, right? So we could stimulate the brain and cause them to do various things. And that in itself isn't all that surprising, right? Given that we understand that the human body is a physical system, you might say, look, just like I can get a reaction out of you by poking your arm, I'm sure if you poke around my brain, then you can get... Um, some reactions and actions out of me as well. But what Delgado found wasn't just that you could stimulate someone's brain and cause them to perform an action. You could also cause them to produce reasons for the action. So when Delgado tried his experiment on humans, not only did they act out the movements without surprise or fear, they also produced reasons for them. The subject, who did not know about the stimulation, considered the activity spontaneous and offered reasons for it. When asked, what are you doing? He would reply, oh, I'm looking for my slippers, I heard a noise, I'm restless, or I was looking under the bed. So Delgado would stimulate their brain, they would look around the room, and he would say, why are you doing that? Oh, I'm looking for something. Now, of course, they weren't really looking at something. They were under the stimulation. They didn't realize they were under the stimulation. But they weren't really looking for something. They were only doing it precisely because he was stimulating their brain, manipulating their brain and psychology to make them act a certain way. Now, when we think about this sort of example, this is precisely the kind of thing that might make determinism seem so alienating, so scary, so threatening. But the thing we have to ask about is, while Jose, the idea that we could be manipulated in some way is legitimately threatening, thing we have to ask about is, is determinism actually like that? If determinism is like a, a you know, someone like Jose Delgado messing with our brain and, and forcing us to perform certain actions, then I would be inclined to say, yeah, if determinism is true, then there's no way we can be free. But is determinism like that? Is the mere fact that our actions have causes, is that the same as us being manipulated to act in certain ways? And what the compatibilist is going to say is that, in fact, uh, that's not actually the case. So, Cain explains this point, and he makes a number of points, or he makes a number of explanations as to why determinism isn't so scary. And the the first one that's most relevant here is, don't confuse determinism with control by other agents. 
Compatibilists can concede, and often do concede, that it does count against our freedom if we are controlled or manipulated by other persons. So if you were being manipulated or controlled in a, an experiment by Jose, Jose Delgado or some mad scientist who hooked a machine up to your brain, then yeah, you wouldn't be free. You would be controlled by that person. And remember the examples we talked about at the beginning with Brave New World and Walden 2, these uh, examples from fiction where people were controlled by behavioral engineers or drugs. Um, it doesn't seem that they're free either. But notice that what makes those cases different from determinism is that in those cases there is an actual person, there's some agent, there's some individual or group of individuals who is uh, attempting to intentionally control your actions. But the universe, of course, isn't a person. The universe is just a set of physical causes that bring about events in an orderly fashion if determinism is true. Now, perhaps it would be different if you had a version of determinism where God was controlling your actions. Well, then there's some person, there's some agent that's controlling them. But if you're just saying that we're determined in the sense that nature has caused you to do certain things, that prior causes in the past cause what you're doing now, well, that's not like a person's controlling you. They're not manipulating you. It just means that the things you do have causes. So Cain goes on to explain, nature by itself does not control us. What is objectionable about control by other agents, whether behavioral, they're behavioral engineers or con men, is that other persons are using us as means to their ends, lording it over us and making us conform to their wishes. But merely being determined does not imply that any other agents are interfering with us or using us in this way. So one famous compatibilist philosopher, Daniel Dennett, says, The environment not being an agent does not control us. And yet the environment over evolutionary time has done a brilliant job of designing us. The standard antidote is to remind oneself constantly that evolutionary processes operate with no foresight and no goals. So the way that your body is set up as a human being is from a process of evolution, right? That's, where the, that's the source of human nature. And that was beyond your control. Also, your particular psychology will have to do with your genetic makeup, which is beyond your control. It will have to do with how you're raised and your environment and your circumstances, which is beyond your control. But all those things, although those things are beyond your control, it's not that you're being, contr being controlled by some tyrant or some group of persons or some agent. It's just that there's various things that are causing your actions that you are not responsible for. But that's very different than being manipulated. So the first thing that determinists say, uh, compatibilists say to make determinism less scary is that determinism does not mean we're being manipulated by the universe. And a last very important point, and this is specifically um, very important for thinking about compatibilism. Cain says, don't confuse causation with constraint. Right, so you might say, well, look, if, if determinism is true, all my actions are caused, they couldn't have happened a different way, I feel very constrained, I feel restrained, I feel like, uh, you know, I, I, I'm sort of limited in my actions, limited in my future. But of course, that's not necessarily the true. Uh, true. To be caused doesn't necessarily mean you're, you're constrained. Cain explains that. He says, well, think about some causes actually give us powers or abilities. Some causes, such as muscular strength or inner strength of will, actually enable us to do what we want. It is therefore a mistake to think that actions are unfree simply because they are caused. So let's say, based on prior events, you have excellent muscular strength, whether those prior events were your genetics or the work you put in in the gym or both. You have a certain ability of muscular strength that was caused by those previous events. So you say, would you say to yourself, oh, I have this excellent muscular strength and, you know, I know it was caused by pre previous events. I feel really constrained. No, you would say, I feel powerful. I can lift heavy objects. I can do all sorts of things with this ability. So the mere fact that you are the product of causation, that your actions are the product of causation, doesn't mean you're constrained. It actually might be liberating. And Cain continues on, let's apply this to freedom. Our free actions are caused by our characters and motives. And this state of affairs is a good thing. For if actions were not caused by our characters and motives, we cannot be held responsible for them. They would not be our actions. 
And this is a critical point for thinking about compatibilism. And to see this, I want to go to one compatibilist philosopher, David Hume, who made this exact point in his Inquiry Concerning Human Understanding. So here's what Hume says. He says, Actions by their very uh, nature are temporary and perishing. And where they proceed not from some cause in the character or disposition of the person who performed them, they can neither redound to his honor if good, nor inf infamy if evil. So let's say you perform some action. You give to charity, you rob a bank, whatever. And let's say, you know, in the case of giving to charity, we want to praise you. In the case of robbing a bank, we want to blame you, maybe even um, exact some legal punishment against you. What is it that allows us to do that? Well, we say, look, the reason we can praise you for giving to charity is because we see that action as being caused by your character. We see it as being caused by who you are. That's the reason we can praise it. Likewise, for the bad action for robbing the bank, we say we can blame you for this, we can punish you for this, because we see that action as being caused by your character and who you are. So notice our whole practice of praise, our whole practice of blame, depends on the idea that your actions are caused by your character. Now, what that means is that if your actions weren't caused by your character, we couldn't praise you. We couldn't blame you. If they were just random events that happened for no reason having to do with you, then how could we say that you deserve praise for them or deserve blame for them? That's what Hume means when he says actions are just very temporary and perishing. What we praise really is not an action. right? When, when we praise someone for giving to charity, we're not primarily just praising this one action, which just could be a one-off event. No, we're, we're supposing that this is a result of the generous character they have built. So in fact, our very idea of moral responsibility requires us to think that our actions are caused by our characters, and our characters, of course, are caused by, well, a long string of causes going to the past. So one of the things the compatibilists will say is that if you want moral responsibility, we need determinism. We need to think that our actions are caused by our characters, by how we think, by the, the values we hold, etc., etc. Okay, so that's the first step, right? The first step is just to say determinism is not so scary. It doesn't mean we're robots. It doesn't mean we our actions don't matter. Um, and in fact, we want our actions to be caused by our characters. Okay, so the next question is, again, how do we define freedom in a way that makes it compatible with determinism? And here I want to, again, return to Hume. So Hume, a very famous uh, compatibilist philosopher, he gives the following definition of freedom, again, in his inquiry concerning human understanding. He says, by liberty or free will, then, we can only mean a power of acting or not acting according to the determinations of the will. That is, if we choose to remain at rest, we may. If we choose to move, we also may. Now, this hypothetical liberty is universally allowed to belong to everyone who is not a prisoner and in chains. Okay, so let's break down this definition. There's really two components of it. First, Hume says that um, liberty is a power of acting or not acting according to the determinations of the will. So what does that mean? The individual with free will just has the power or ability to do what they want or do what they choose. So if you choose to do A instead of B, you can do A. If you want to do A instead of B, then you have, if you're free, you have the power or ability to do A. You have the power or ability to have a salad for lunch instead of a turkey sandwich. And that's fundamentally what compatibilists think freedom is. It's just the ability to do what you want if we want to break it down. And what does this mean? What does this entail or imply? It means that there must be an absence of constraints or impediments that prevent us from doing what we want. So when Hume says, now this hypothetical liberty is universally allowed to belong to anyone who's not a prisoner in chains, he's saying, look, anyone who is not restrained or prevented from doing what they want is free. So if you want to have a, a salad for lunch at a certain restaurant, then if the restaurant's open, if no one is forcing you to remain in your home, if you are physically able to get to the restaurant, then if you're free to act on that desire, then you're free. That's all freedom is. You have a desire to eat a salad at this restaurant. 
and you carry it out. When would you not be free? Well, for instance, if you were locked in your home, if you were physically ill or physically injured, not able to leave, if the restaurant was closed, then you wouldn't be free to do that action. So do the, when you think about the question, do we have free will, the question really just is, are we free with regard to any specific action? Sometimes we're able to do what we want and we're free with, uh, in relation to that action. Other times we're not able to do what we want. And so we're not free with relation to that action. And this fundamentally is what freedom is. And Cain, again, gives more examples of the sorts of things that make us not free. So he says, I would not be free to take the bus of various things if, if various things pr prevented me, such as being in jail or if someone had tied me up or if someone was holding me at gunpoint, commanding me not to move, if I were paralyzed, if the buses were running, or if fear of crowded buses compelled me to avoid them. Right. So there's all sorts of ways you can be impeded from doing what you want. But the idea behind the compatibilist view of freedom is that if you can do what you want, then that fundamentally is freedom. Freedom is just the power or ability to carry out your desires. And so we can think about it like this. A person is not free to do X to the extent that her desire to do X is prevented. So if you have some desire and you're prevented from bringing about that desired outcome, because someone's coercing you or there's a physical impediment or, or an illness or whatever, then you're not free. But if you have a desire and nothing prevents you from acting on it and you successfully fulfill that desire, then guess what? You are free. And it's important to state here why this definition of freedom is completely compatible with determinism. Because suppose it's the case that what you do next is completely determined by the laws of nature and prior physical causes. So your actions are entirely determined. The future is closed, right? There is no other option that can come about given what has happened in the past. Okay, that might all be true, but that doesn't prevent you from doing what you want. If what you want is to eat a salad at this specific restaurant and all the causes leading back to the Big Bang are causing you to go to the restaurant and eat the salad, then you're doing what you, exactly what you want. The, those past causes are giving you the power or ability to do what you want. You're getting your desired outcome. And so you have free will. You are free. And so the compatibilists will say there's really nothing at all that's inconsistent with what we mean by freedom and the idea that we're determined. So we get the best of both worlds. We can talk about what it means to act freely or not be free, and we can do this all within a scientific picture of the world where human beings are subject to physical causes. Now the third question I mentioned, and this might be the most difficult one, is remember we said that free will requires the ability to do otherwise. Now, Compatibilists are determinists, and so this means the future is closed. So what do we mean by the ability to do otherwise in this context? How can a compatibilist, compatibilist explain that? And to see how they do this, let's take one example. Let's say that um, we're asking the question, um, let's say Ryan rides the bus. We're asking the question, did he have the ability to not ride the bus? Was I free in riding the bus or was I not free? Was I free to have not ridden the bus? Okay, so we're asking the question about Ryan rode the bus, but could he have done otherwise? Now, the first thing to note is that the compatibilists will say, well, really we're thinking about two different scenarios or two different worlds. There's the actual world where there was a long chain of causes those causes gave Ryan a desire to ride the bus, and then he actually rode the bus. The other thing that compatibilists will point out is that we can imagine another world, another possible state of affairs, philosophers will call this a possible world, where there is a different chain of causes. Things happen differently in the past. Because things happen differently in the past, Ryan developed a desire to stay home, and so Ryan stayed home. So the first thing that compatibilists just need to get you to accept is that although the actual world is what did happen, I, I wanted to ride the bus and I did ride the bus, it's possible to imagine or conceive 
of a world in which Ryan wanted something else and in which Ryan acted on that desire, namely a desire to stay home. Now, why does this matter? Well, when a compatibilist wants to stay, what does it mean to say you have the ability to do otherwise? They'll just say all it means is that there is some possible world where if you had done something, if you had wanted to do something different, you would have done that thing. So in the actual world, Ryan rode the bus. Did Ryan have the ability to do something different, to stay home and watch television? Sure. If Ryan had had the desire to stay home and watch television, then Ryan would have stayed home and watched television. If Ryan would have had the desire to stay home and work in his garden, Ryan would have stayed home and work, worked in his garden. So did Ryan have the ability to do otherwise? Well, yeah. I can imagine a world where Ryan had a different desire and Ryan acted on that desire. So Ryan had the ability to do otherwise in any sense that's actually meaningful. And... So I think this shows us something important about the compatibilist view of freedom. On the compatibilist view of freedom, it's not actually required that the future is open. It's not required that other alternatives could have come about given what happened in the past. All that's required is that we could imagine Ryan Ryan having a different set of desires, wanting to do something else and doing that thing. Because remember, for the compatibilist, all freedom is is doing what you want. And I think the best example, it's an example that was given by another philosopher named John Locke. An example which gets at this is that for the compatibilist, freedom is like this. Imagine there was a man who was locked in a room. And there was no way for him to escape the room. Now at first you might say, well this seems like a prisoner. This seems like someone who is the definition of not being free. But is it possible for that person to be free? Well, sure, the compatibilist will say, imagine also that that person didn't want anything, didn't want to do anything else besides stay in that room. Now, in a sense, right, freedom is kind of like that. Because if the person didn't want to do anything but stay in that room, it doesn't actually matter if the door is locked. Right? Imagine the door is unlocked. That person's still going to stay in the room because they're doing precisely what they want to do. What they want to do is stay in the room. Nothing is preventing them from doing it. So they have free will. They're free in that instance. Then you ask, could they have done otherwise? Sure. If the door was unlocked and if this person had wanted to leave the room, they could leave the room. You can imagine another possible world where they don't want to stay in the room and in fact they don't. So for the compatibilist, Freedom fundamentally is getting what you want. It's successfully acting on your desires. It doesn't matter that those desires are determined. And what we mean by the ability to do otherwise is just that if you had wanted to do something else, you could have done that too. If Ryan Ryan wanted to ride the bus, he could ride the bus. If he wanted to stay home, he could stay home. Okay, so that's the fundamental compatibilist picture. And again, I think it's quite attractive for various reasons. I think it's certainly attractive in that it gives us this reconciliation between free will and our scientific picture of the human being. But of course, there's a couple important objections to consider to the classical compatibilist view. And to do this, I'm going to discuss two different cases. So the first case I'll call the unwilling drug addict. Imagine someone who is addicted to a potent drug and uses this drug every day to satisfy the cravings of her addiction. She greatly desires to use the drug and faces no external constraint that prevents her from obtaining or using the substance. Suppose also, however, that she realizes how her drug use is harming her work and family life. For this reason, she she wishes she did not have the desire to use the drug or wishes she was not addicted to it. So what do we imagine? We're imagining a classic case of addiction right because in some cases someone who's addicted to a substance or addicted to anything might be so into their addiction they don't even have the ability to reflect and say i wish i wasn't addicted but oftentimes especially after the addict has been in their addiction for a while they might start to they're they continue to use the substance they're addicted to while at the same time wishing 
and telling themselves, I wish I did not have this addiction. They wish they were a different sort of person. Now, the reason this matters is because typically we think someone who is suffering from an addiction is not someone who is free. In fact, they're the exact opposite of freedom. Yeah, what the, what the compatibilist says is that, well, freedom is just getting what you want. It's doing what you want. And in some sense, the drug addict is doing what they want, right? Though they have a desire to use the drug, no one is stopping them from using the drug, and they successfully act on that desire. Yet for all that, they're not free. And I think this brings up one important point. It goes back to Cain's distinction between surface freedom and deep freedom. Cain said that surface freedom is just getting what you want. The people in Walden 2 get what they want because they've been programmed to want only what they can have. But he said that's not deep freedom. That's not fundamental control of your life. And that sort of fundamental control of your life might just be exactly what it seems like the drug addict is missing here. So one thing to think about with compatibilism is, is it really true that we can just simply say someone is free as long as they're doing what they want? Or do we need a, a richer, more complex account of freedom? So that's one thing to think about. There's also a second sort of objection that gets directly to the heart of whether the compatibilist view of freedom really gives us everything we want in free will. And so I'll consider one other case here. We'll call this the compatibilist judge. Ryan, we'll imagine, has pled guilty to committing a grisly murder and is standing before the judge awaiting his sentence. Before telling Ryan his punishment, the judge asks if Ryan has anything to say in his defense. Ryan, for his part, doesn't have a firm view on freedom of the will. However, Ryan knows that this particular judge is a causal determinist. So Ryan pleads to the judge, I know I've committed a horrible crime, and what I did was an atrocious moral wrong. However, I think I deserve a light punishment, if any punishment at all. As you know, judge, my actions were determined by a previous string of past events, as well as the fundamental physical laws of the universe. Therefore, I could not have done otherwise, and if I have not done otherwise than kill this poor innocent man, then I cannot be held responsible for this act. The judge considers this carefully, gently stroking her chin and looking pensively through one of the courtroom's windows. Unfortunately for Ryan, the judge is also a compatibilist, an unfortunate turn of events for him. She responds, It is of course true that your action was determined to happen by past events. Still, it does not follow that you are not responsible for it, or that you could not have done otherwise. You could have done otherwise. Remember that if you had had a different set of desires, and if past events had gone differently, then you would have acted differently. Therefore, I'm sentencing you to death. Well, the first thing to think about here is, is this a good response to Ryan? The judge says, yes, I know that there's nothing else you could have done. Given what happened in the past, there's nothing else you could have done but kill this poor innocent man. So it was beyond your control. But the judge says, well, I'm a compatibilist, so I think you actually had the ability to do otherwise. And what do I mean? I just mean if you had been the kind of person who wanted to do something else or didn't want to kill this person, then you wouldn't have killed this person. I can imagine a possible world where you are a fundamentally different person with different desires, different values, different commitments, and you don't kill this person. And of course that's true. Like I can imagine... All sorts of possibilities where people are different and they want to do different things and they in fact do those different things. But the, it seems that the judge's response here just elides the fundamental question. If Ryan has no control over what he desires, if Ryan has no control over whether he acts on those desires, then how can we say he fundamentally had the ability to, to do otherwise? I can imagine a different universe where Ryan doesn't kill the poor innocent man, but that's not the universe we're in, and Ryan had no ability or power to bring that universe about. And so I think fundamentally one of the major objections to compatibilism is simply that it doesn't give us everything we want out of freedom. It gives us a good way of talking about freedom. Right? Of saying, yeah, I was free to have lunch because that's what I wanted to do and no one stopped me. 
But fundamentally, if freedom is about being in control of your life, being in control of your destiny, being fundamentally responsible and accountable for your actions, then while the compatibilist makes a valiant attempt to combine freedom and determinism, that attempt may not give us any of those things and may not, may not give us a vision of the human person that is responsible and accountable for the things that he or she does. And if that's what the free will debate is really about, then the compatibilist account may still be somewhat lacking. So I will stop there. As always, thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.